So as a family therapist, I can't help but to impose my weird theories upon movies that I watch, such as Star Wars. You know, Rebecca? I totally understand. Yeah. When I'm seeing movies like Star Wars, I'm just thinking, oh, trauma. Oh, attachment style disruption. Oh, that's an issue. That, that's going to hurt. That, that'll that present problems when, when Anakin grows up. That's going to be a problem for his psychology. Do you do the same thing? Uh, totally. Well, you, Rebecca, wanted to talk about intergenerational trauma in the family of the Skywalker family. Is that correct? That is my mission today. So I thought I would accommodate you, Rebecca, and we would indeed talk about that because we all know it's kind of a stretch for me to talk about Star Wars. Having seen all seven movies in a row, in a single day. In a single day. Welcome to the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm chair of the Couple and Family Therapy Program at Antioch University, Seattle, and I'm also a licensed marriage and family therapist. Hi, I'm Rebecca Bloom. I'm a licensed mental health counselor and a board-certified art therapist with a private practice in Seattle. In Pioneer Square, specifically. Yes, working with adults, mostly addressing intergenerational trauma. Yeah. Well, let's start from the beginning. Shmi Skywalker. Yes. Shmi. I always thought that name was kind of funny, Shmi. He, I think he is Jewish. Shmi it's... is sort of sh- like Shmoo, which yeah. is, wasn't there like a... Like there, a cartoon called Shmoo or something? There was. I, I'm sure I have an ancestor, Shmi Schlockenberg. <laughs> Shmi Schlockenberg. So Shmi Skywalker has an unknown beginning. We don't really know where she's from, from the movies or from the books, I think. I'm not quite sure if we know even from the books. But we're going to leave out the books. We're just going to mainly talk about what okay. we know from the movies. Because if you go into the books and the comic books, there's a, there's a lot more detail here. You're going to lose me in the comic book world. Yeah. But a lot of that might be thrown out in the canon as we move forward with the new movies. Anyway. So but what we do know is that Shmi, Anakin or Darth Vader's mother, yes. is a slave at the beginning of episode one which we can say has got to be traumatic. Sure. I mean, we can see it in our culture today, right. what slavery has begot Do you want to talk more about that? Uh, well, there is a, a field of psychology known as post-traumatic slavery syndrome, which looks at how the history of slavery has impacted African-American families, families being ripped apart over and over again, and how that's led to people... Uh, feeling like they're unable to trust, high rates of depression, high rates of families splitting now. So you would see that as an example of intergenerational trauma, events repeating from generation to generation. Yeah, whenever I think about this sort of thing, I just think about how when you bring this topic up to general white public, they'll say, well, slavery has been gone for a long time, so what's the big deal? And you know, black people must just not get their S together because that's why they have all the problems they do. And I, and I just think that when you know how people actually operate, you know that traumas get passed down. Mm-hmm. Polish people, for instance, have, have experienced just... Are you Polish? Yeah, I'm half Polish. Okay. Polish people have experienced, I don't know, a thousand years of difficulty being smashed between different large groups of people, including like uh, Genghis Khan and the Huns and, and the Russians and the Germans and the Nazis and just being constantly raped and killed and genocide and enslaved and just horrible, horrible things. And even though in the past... 30, 40 years, things have been relatively peaceful compared to the past. It, all that trauma is still with us. And the, the, what I tell people is, is to try to help them understand is, so let's say you have a slave in America, in the United States, and you are in captivity, you're routinely beat, you feel horrible about yourself, you have, you have, you, your self-esteem is affected, you are traumatized regularly, you're raped, you're made to feel like a substandard human, and you internalize that. It's, it's, it's only natural for, for us to internalize these messages and to start feeling as if they're true. And then, say, in your lifetime, you become, quote-unquote, a freed slave. Well, 
you start having children. Well, when you have children, your self-esteem issues, your trauma, the emotional regulation issues are going to affect your parenting. And as you parent your children, in a sense, that trauma is transferred to the child, even though the child has not been traumatized mm -hmm. directly. And some people say, oh, well, you're blaming the, it's on, on the parents. No, I'm blaming the marginalization and the slavery and the trauma and the genocide that occurred. It's only natural that there's going to be an effect on the children of those people who have been traumatized. Well, those children who are raised by traumatized parents experience trauma too as a result of parents who are traumatized exhibiting traumatized affected parenting. Those traumatized children have children and further the cycle. Over the generations, things tend to improve with, with help. But the problem is in the United States is black people are marginalized continually through our society. For instance, with Irish people in our, in our society, since they integrate visually into the white America, they are subsumed more easily, but there are, uh, to a lesser extent, intergenerational trauma for Irish people as well. It's just less pronounced because they blend more easily. So all the way up until today, and you can see in statistics, you see that African Americans have greater rates of depression, greater rates of alcohol abuse to cope with emotional problems. Your dog wants to get in my lap. Because she sensed how distressed you are. <laughs> and she's here to offer some animal-assisted therapy. Thank you. All right, so we've got Miss Skywalker. Sh Shmi, that's right. Shmi. She's and just in honor of the podcast, uh, I have a mug that was given to me for my birthday, I think, by Umberto. It has a a face of Darth Vader, and it says, who's your daddy? I am so jealous of that mug. Yeah, well, <laughs> you cannot, it's one of a kind. <laughs> it is not on the internet. <laughs> I'm lying. Okay, so she's a slave, and she's been traumatized by that, and that is naturally going to affect the way that she raises her child, her one child, Anakin. And we don't know who's your daddy. We don't know who Anakin's daddy is. Right, so that's another shall we say, trauma or attachment disruption in that right. Anakin has he, no father. He has no father figure, which we know uh, really messes people up when you don't have a daddy. Right. Or I should say a stable family system with pri one more primary caregivers. Right. What I know that happens frequently to only mothers and only children, particularly if they're boys sometimes. Is, is Fight Club. Is Fight Club. <laughs> is that you have a child, a boy, who feels kind of like a child and kind of like a husband, kind mm -hmm. of like a companion, kind of like a, a protector. So we have a parentified child in Anakin. Right. Someone who is denied a childhood, mm -hmm. someone who has to be much older than he is, and has trauma as a result of that. So we see that in the first movie. He's already hustling at a young age. He's out on the streets selling his wares, not his body at this point. But. Yeah. Well, as far as we know. <laughs> and he is enslaved, and he's made to work at, since he probably was able to. Maybe before he was five, he's, he has to work. He can't play like, like a regular kid. So... He's a slave child himself, which provides its own trauma to Anakin Skywalker. He is separated from his mother at a young age. Mm -hmm. When Qui-Gon Jinn discovers that he is touched by the Force, he decides to bring him to the Jedi Academy to train him as a Jedi, as a youngling, as they say. That's a really unfortunate label, by the way, youngling. Oops. I remember when I saw that in episode two or one, I can't remember in the theaters, everyone laughed, you know, it's like the younglings and like, everyone's just like, anytime you have a word that people, I mean, did you not run it past a few right. people, George Lucas, if you would have ran that past anyone, they would have been like, uh, you got to change that name. How about just like, like you have Padawan. How about like, how about touched one? No, yeah. That's equally bad. Yeah. How about, yeah. How about, uh, how about young Padawan or, how about another word like Padawan, like, you know, uh, grasshopper or something, you know? 
Well, and we've been talking before we started recording about how many ways George Lucas is just pulling, pulling, pulling from everywhere. And I think that the the Jedi training is similar to how they uh, do like the Dalai Lama, like they find the child, but eventually that child's family comes and joins them at the monastery. That kid isn't isolated for the rest of time. So that's why the Dalai Lama is so well adjusted, even though he was pulled from his family early. I didn't know that. That makes a lot of sense. And I'm glad to hear that because... I think that we underestimate as a society the effect of these sorts of things. When you take away... Have you seen Room, the movie Room? No, I, for my own mental health, (laughs) need to avoid seeing that movie. It is... It's not as heart-wrenching or as depressing as I thought it would be. Mm -hmm. It is actually strangely uplifting (laughs) in a lot of ways. Um, But it... It shows, I think, in a different way than is typically done in cinema, the the child perspective of someone who's, say, five years old, who needs his or her mother in particular. And um, anyway, so my point is, is that it's it's often like, oh, well, he just... Like, I have families today that I treat where they send their... 15 year old to boarding school Mm -hmm. for the for the year and they visit them once a month or call them on sundays or something and lo and behold there are problems to their attachment and their self-esteem and their adjustment i just think come on people um understand that children are dependent emotionally and developmentally on their parents and when you take them away from their parents that has problems so like I often will talk with therapists in training and, and when we run into situations where there's a lot of chaos in the family, there'll be this impulse that they'll have that is typical to people in society that's like, well, we got to get that child away from that family. Mm-hmm. We got to we got to get CPS in there, take the child away mm-hmm. and place them in a foster home and, or some other situation. And I say, whoa, whoa, whoa. Even though I respect and agree with the impulse to protect this child from abuse, there's there's a, a lesser of two evils here in, in that uh, a potential lesser of two evils is to leave them with the family and try to help the family to not abuse the child, even though the parents will never be as good, so to speak, as other parents that we can find. The disruption to their attachment when we take that child away from those parents, even though those parents have major deficits in their parenting, is so great that it'll be worse off for the child to be removed from the family. Yeah, I mean, I really see it in my adult clients who've had really disrupted childhoods. They usually come in to process their marriage and say, you know, why can't I connect now? Why is my partner so different from me? So, you know, usually they're wrong. Everyone knows the person they're married to is always wrong, of course. (laughs) But, (laughs) But there is this sense that... um it is so difficult to connect. And so we have to do work about their past to unwind how they got that story that they can't ever be connected to the person that they're in a primary relationship with. Right. It's just so toxic. Right. It's hard for people that have been, uh, damaged, shall we say, in that way. I don't mean that in the sense that they're bad people, but it's it's damage to their limbic system, you might say, or damage to their attachment system. And what it does for many people is it makes them extremely distrustful of other people because they learned early on that they can't really depend on other people. It also makes them feel really bad about themselves because children don't understand how things work and they tend to internalize things and and blame themselves for a lot of things. And so even though they might have, no, for instance, with Anakin, even though he might have understood the reasons why he was taken to Jedi training, he might have actually thought his mother didn't love him enough to hold on to him or that he didn't deserve to be raised by his mother or something like that. Children Whenever I hear this sort of thing, particularly when I was younger, I would be like, a kids couldn't possibly believe such a silly thing. But kids do. It's, it's actually quite common for kids to 
the, the thing that I tell people is, and, and usually people understand this, is kids believe the universe revolves around them. Mm-hmm. And so anything that happens has to be because of them. It can't possibly be because of someone else because they can't really conceive of things generating outside of themselves that don't have to do with their internal world. That's a, you know exaggeration to some extent. For instance, I, I always tell this example, but I was talking with this kid, I think he was about seven or eight, and in this family, and I just talked with the kid alone for a bit. And I was trying to figure out what was going on with him. And eventually he told me that he was fairly certain that his parents got divorced because he didn't mow the lawn one day. Mm -hmm. Because what happened was he thought everything was fine in his family. Even though his parents fought sometimes, he didn't think they were on the verge of divorce. And his dad said, mow the lawn. And he was was like, oh, okay, I'll do it later. And then he, he went upstairs to goof around and when he came back down his parents confronted him and said we're getting a divorce and the dad like picked up his stuff and like it was a compulsive it was an impulsive thing that mm-hmm. had been building up for a while and the dad says I'm moving out and and the dad and the parents never really lived together from that point forward and so the kid sort of extrapolated from that and said well it must be they must have divorced because I didn't mow the lawn right and even though this was many years later and he was you know older he still totally believed that and what a terrible weight to carry for a child through life, right? So Jack Cornfield, the pioneer of mindfulness counseling, would call that person the map maker. So when these tragedies happen, a, the child mind makes up a story and a role for themselves of how we now have to exist in life. And so that young child mindset um, that has a pretty locked down way of working because the world can be so chaotic as you move up into adulthood, it doesn't always work. Right. And that's the work I often am doing with my clients, unwinding that map maker's choice. Now that you're an adult, can we thank that map maker for getting you that far? But I mean, back to Anakin, when your hair trigger response is anger because that got you through as a kid right. and you carry that into adulthood, right. you can find yourself in some pretty sticky interstellar uh, planetary fights. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so moving forward with more traumas, Anakin, he experiences his mother being, I think, raped and brutalized by the sand people. Is it implied that she's raped by the sand people? I think I actually blocked this part out. <laughs> Along with a lot of the first three movies, I can't hold it as well as you can. Well, in the third movie, Anakin, I think in a vision or something, figures out that his mother is in danger and goes to her back on Tatooine, finds out from uh, from her new husband, whom she married after Anakin left, which is Klieg Klieg Lars. Anyway, he uh, tells... Tells Anakin, your mom was abducted by the Sand People. He goes to his mom. She's in a in a tent with the Sand People. He sneaks in there and sees her brutalized, about to die, and then witnesses her die in his arms. And he also believes that he is the next ruler of the universe to some extent. And it's gonna mess you up. Yeah, it's gonna mess you up anyway. And he believed he could have saved her if he would have been a better son Mm -hmm. and a better warrior. If he could have detected this earlier, ridded the universe or the galaxy of bad guys, this is a a, a particular trauma, that a turning point in his personality. So he then internalizes the aggressor, which we often see in families where there's a lot of trauma, and becomes the aggressor himself. But I, I want to talk about his partner choice because mm. I think we're missing an important piece here. Can you describe his lady friend? His lady friend's name is Padme Amidala or Queen Amidala at the time that he meets her as a young person. He's younger than she is. And which, you know, looking for a mama. As soon as he leaves his mom. He finds. He finds an older woman to fall in love with. Mm-hmm. Isn't that strange? Classic. Classic. And... He is she's also, powerful. She's beautiful. Beautiful, powerful. Uh, talks to him in a nice way that really no one else does because Qui-Gon Jinn and Obi-Wan are sort of 
treating him like typical stoic Jedi in their very standoffish stoic way but Padme comes along and is very nice to him and she has amazing outfits she has amazing outfits and really good hair great hair and good midriff by the way <laughs> if I might say and she and he falls in love with her uh, lo and behold but she is also somewhat uh, unavailable to him which is also very classic when you come from a traumatized background is right. that the problem in partner choice it's just hard to kind of um, when you have not regulated your own emotions it's hard to then connect to someone who could fill those because you don't know what a healthy attachment looks like right right if he hadn't been a slave child and hadn't been traumatized and had a father figure he would have said to himself as because it's fine to have a crush on someone when you're seven it's another thing when he grows up by episode two and he seems like he seems like he might be 18 19 20 or something it's another thing to hold out for that person i mean by then he should have said well let's start dating people my own age or people that aren't uh, unavailable having said that the jedi order uh, prevents their jedi from dating which is another denial of a basic human or all the different types of Jedi. <laughs> I assume they all have similar limbic systems and needs regarding partnership. The Jedi Order denies their, their members this, this important need, and this further frustrates him because he is desperate for... To connect. To connect because he's been ripped away from his mom, because he's been traumatized, uh, but everyone, I imagine, has that need. Well, and also children who are adopted or abandoned have a high need to, often to have children themselves. Yeah. They want to repair what has been done to them or to have a child is the fantasy a chance to connect again. Right. So to right the wrong. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So let's look at Padme for a second. A little bit more. She she's been traumatized from war, from mm -hmm. episode two one through three. We see her involved in war and killing herself. That's one thing that's often ignored in our society is the trauma of killing. Mm -hmm. It is traumatizing to kill other people. Although now that I think about it, has she actually killed anyone aside from droids? I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. She probably didn't, but she did have decoys because of. Um, bombs going off and killing, uh, being threatened to kill her. And she witnessed, I think at the beginning of episode two, a decoy that was dressed up like her was killed in her place. And then she runs to the decoy and the decoy dies in her arms. Once again, more horrible trauma. Tra more horrible trauma. Horrible trauma. And in the movies like this, they tend to gloss over that. But as I watch it, I'm just thinking, oh, that's going to hurt. <laughs> that's going to hurt the, the brain. That's a mess up right that, there. Yeah, that's going to have some... That's, that's a potential ulcer. She needs therapy <laughs> from that point forward. Also, uh, the wars are traumatizing to Anakin. Anakin has to not only kill, but also see a lot of death. Mm -hmm. He sees a lot of clones being killed and Jedi and other people around him. Lots and lots of death. This is undeniably traumatizing to people, and he was traumatized in that way. He was also severely injured later in episode yes. three by his father figure, Obi-Wan. What's up with that? Who so he was always looking for to replace that missing father figure. Right. And perhaps, I never thought of this actually. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Mochi, for making noise. Um, the fact that he probably, it's common to be angry at your absent father. Mm -hmm. To have a lot of personal hurt and anger at the father that never was. Well, here comes Obi-Wan. Well, right? and also, I'm sure you've felt this teaching, but for those in authority, they often get that misplaced anger for right. people who have attachment issues. Right. Transference or displacement from their anger and hurt toward this unnamed non uh, present father figure gets directed at, at Obi-Wan. But 
he has to suppress it because he's desperate for Obi-Wan's attention and love, and he manages to suppress it for the most part until it explodes in the end of episode three when he perceives Obi-Wan as working against him and betraying him in getting his wife Padme to be against him. He that's the that's the kicker in his head is he thinks that Obi-Wan uh, betrayed him by getting Padme to work against Anakin and then they end up fighting and then Obi-Wan proceeds to cut off one arm and or his remaining arm and his two legs and leaves him for dead burning next to a a pool of a river of lava further betrayal uh, which turns him into Darth Vader. So would you uh diagnose Darth Vader with narcissistic personality disorder? Well, it's interesting because there's certain narcissistic elements to Anakin growing up. It's mm-hmm. hard to diagnose Darth because he's he, a well, he's a sociopath. Well, he kind of has a job too. That's mm-hmm. another thing. Like how do you diagnose one of the generals in the Nazi thing, right. you know, it, I'm just doing my job. Yeah, well, it's hard to distinguish from the social order mm-hmm. and the place you have in your society from your innate personality, shall we say. You can act narcissistically, and you can act psychopathic without actually being psychopathic. I mean, technically speaking, half of Germany was acting psychopathic, but were they all psychopaths, right. you know? So... During but, World War II. But you could see how all of his multiple traumas would allow him to then be so detached as he steps into the persona of Darth Vader. Totally. Here's my hypothesis that I just generated after you asked this question, is that and, you know, if we look at Anakin, we would say that he definitely had somewhat of a narcissistic issue mm-hmm. in that he... And it was fueled by everyone telling him he was the one to bring balance to the force and he was the chosen one. That's too big of a job. And he is the only son of his mother, so he has his mother's full attention and his mother even thinks there's something special about him. And and so you get all those messages, you tend to have a bit of a narcissistic streak. But that to me is not the genesis of the Darth Vader sociopathy, which... I would say, is the multiple traumas. When you mm-hmm. traumatize someone over and over mm-hmm. again, there are certain defense mechanisms that kick in to cope with the damage incurred from those traumas. And So I think you, that, we see this with child soldiers today. Yeah. You traumatize someone enough, you tell them to go out and kill and to get your love, and they will, they will do it. Right. And you have in our society soldiers coming back from the theater of war that will commit atrocities back home, that will beat their wife, that will commit crimes. And they are, are they innately uh, wife beaters? Some of them perhaps, yes, but, but, but most of them know. When you traumatize someone, it creates defense mechanisms and certain reactions to triggers that result in a wide variety of antisocial behaviors or shall we say trauma reactions. And some of those, a, a percentage, small percentage of those involve atrocities such as killing other people or the desire to dominate this sort of thing. It's a way for, you know, specifically with, with Anakin, you could say, after being traumatized and victimized and controlled and enslaved and betrayed, a logical coping strategy is to say, I'm going to be in control of everything. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be in control of everything and I'm going to dominate everyone and I'm never going to have compassion. I'm never going to allow anyone in my life and I'm going to destroy anyone who gets in my way because if I don't, then that leads to a lack of, of control, which leads to terrible things like my wife dying and my father figure trying to kill me and my mother dying and me becoming enslaved. So we could see him having that coping mechanism. Yes. So then he has uh, another trauma, the, perhaps his final trauma as Anakin, in which he basically witnesses through his force vision 
the death of his of his wife right of padme and he also knows that he might have caused her death mm-hmm. because of his own turmoil so imagine that right your one reason for turning to the dark side is to save her life because you've been seeing visions of her death and the empire the emperor is like is like ooh you know i've i have the dark side can help save your wife i you know and so that's his whole reason for betraying everything the jedi order and his father figure and everything and then in the end he through the force accidentally kills his own his own wife that's that's terrible it's going to mess you up totally totally mess you up and i mean it's akin to say you're driving a car and you are distracted and you get in a car accident and your wife is sitting in the passenger seat and she gets killed you even though you didn't purposely murder your wife imagine the guilt and the shame sure. and the you, you horrible never get over it yeah exactly so that really pushes him over the edge and the darth vader the transition to darth vader is complete shall we say he unbeno- he unknowingly to himself has twins yeah who carry this legacy yes luke skywalker and leia organa luke is raised by owen and brew lars on tatooine luke continues the trauma by knowing he's adopted by his uncle and aunt, knowing that his parents must have abandoned him on some level. He doesn't really understand why. Uh, often adopted children, regardless of how hard we try to make them feel accepted and loved, always, well, frequently, I would say, are, ha- looking. are looking and feel a certain level of hurt from these, uh, from the notion that their parents abandoned them right. at, at birth. Yeah. Um, even if the parents die, again, because children are magical thinkers, they still wonder if they, if they, they weren't to blame some, somehow. Well, and often I've seen it is they're looking for someone who looks like them. They're looking for themselves and someone else. Mm-hmm. And I've worked with many wonderful adults adoptive parents um but the child themselves has questions yeah who looks like me who acts like me you know literally where did i come from right right so then in episode four he goes through the trauma of seeing his adoptive parents die we he sees their burned corpses emerging from the Lars Homestead, which has got to have an effect on you, right? That's no good. And he instantly goes into a, an adventure, and no one ever stops to talk with him about it, which I find which ir- is this not th- responsible to his emotional needs. So one of the most interesting parts of this movie for me is how often people who are in grief about death don't have a community to process that death with. And it, skipping ahead, it's very interesting how the seventh movie ends that they process that death as a group and people aren't alone. Mm. But that experience of processing death on your own without a community is its own form of trauma. Right. Think of how every culture has elaborate rituals to process death. Right. So if you don't go through those rituals somewhere in you, you're missing a full completion of processing that death. Right. So then Luke, through episodes four through six, sees a lot of people die, perhaps even more traumatizing than Anakin, his father, because these are real people dying. The Mm -hmm. stormtroopers and the rebel fighters are real people. They're not clones and and droids. They're real people dying around him all the time. And how traumatizing that is. Again, if you're a veteran and have been, or just a civilian, having been through war and witnessing death, it is a, a horrible thing to experience. And it, as we sometimes will say in slang, it rewires the brain. It's not just a, oh, that was difficult for me. It's, it actually changes, if, if experienced in a, the typical way, it actually will change the connections in the brain as such that it creates symptoms as a result of that. Mm-hmm. And so you get people who shut down, who seem... Like they're not, you know, like they're kind of a shadow of themselves. Mm. 
And I think it's so interesting how, especially in the second movie, like friendships become so important. So often you see like in traumatized teen communities where there's a lot of teen violence, those peers become your best friends, become your surrogate family. Maybe the older member feels like a dad. You see that in the drag world where people are, pull, you know, their families reject them. They go out on the street. They find someone who's a little bit older to teach them how to do drag, and that becomes their new family. There will probably be trauma again in that family. These are communities that have a high rate of um, loss through being shot, being killed, you know, drug addiction, and then those traumas just repeat over and over again. Like gangs. Same, like gangs. Same thing. When you are of a marginalized, uh, poor community, family, and you see little path for the future for yourself and your families have your family attachments have been disrupt, disrupted through your families being fugitives or being marginalized or enslaved in the past you will turn to your friends as a way of trying to get that family connection and there will be a father figure and a mother figure and the older sister that you never had and the younger sister you never had and the the jokester and the one who fixes things through violence and the one who is warm. Like there are family systems in these gangs that are sought after because they are unable to get it from what we might call more functional places. So Anna, so Luke Skywalker is desperate for his friends, Leia and Han and Chewie and R2 and, and C-3PO, even though he doesn't know Leia as a sister, <laughs> But he is desperate for that, and Yoda is like, do not, do not go to your friends. You have to stay for your training. I know, he, he says, I know you will fail, and your, your mission will ultimately fail if you go to your friends net right now instead of completing your training. And he goes anyway, just, just to your point. Yoda is so old school. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't understand the trauma bond. Yeah, but it's interesting. I, I thought recently upon wa- re-watching all the movies, what could have happened or what would have likely happened if Luke had stayed on Dagobah with Yoda during Empire and not gone to the Cloud City to save his friends, you know? Because, say, Leia would have been imprisoned, I'm guessing, mm-hmm. probably. Mm-hmm. And But honestly, when I think about it, Luke didn't have anything to do with Leia and Lando getting free. Now that I think about it, Luke didn't do a single thing. Well, he goes there because he has to meet Darth Vader to learn that he's his father. That's the whole, if you're going to look at the story arc, I think that's why he has to go. Well, the story arc for sure, but he went back for the purpose of saving his friends, but he didn't save them at all. Han still was encased Put into in, carbonite. in carbonite and, and given to, uh, to um, what's his name? <laughs> Uh, Boba big Fett, slimy guy. Boba Fett, who gives him who gives him to Jabba the Hutt on Tatooine, uh, and Leia and Chewie and Lando and R two and C three PO get away on their own because Lando gets his his uh, Lobot guy to uh, you know figure out a way of getting him free. So Luke doesn't really do anything that I think about. I never thought about that. He just sort of. Basically got his hand He's cut off. He's just there to lose his hand. So I may have told this story already, but so when I worked at a psych hospital, Sunday was movie day. They got to pick whatever the movie they wanted. This, this original second Star Wars movie, Empire Strikes Back, was a favorite. I've probably seen it 15 times in a psych environment and have often wondered, why is this a totem movie in this setting? And I think it's because so many of the clients there had lost a family member, been betrayed by a family member. You know, these archetypal things that are happening in the second movie uh, related on a, on a resonant level to people who are pretty low functioning at the time. Right. Interesting. So Anakin grows up and becomes Darth Vader. And after Luke and Leia are born... Anakin, Darth, is continuing to search for his children. He's continuing that desire through the Darth Vader persona 
to connect with his family when he learns that Luke is his son. That's all. That's all. All of his focus is on trying to get Luke to join him. Mm-hmm. He doesn't want to kill Luke. Right. He he, he chops off his hand as a way of just trying to stop the fighting. He's he's join me, join me, and he's saying, "Be with me. I am your father." How awesome would it be for us to be together? He's still desperate for mm-hmm. that family experience, but he's so dysfunctional with it. <laughs> Because it's so hard to have those conversations with lightsabers. It just really, really is. You maybe want to be at a Starbucks, you know, when you have that reunification, maybe just budget a half an hour on that first meeting. Yeah. You know, but and avoid <laughs> chopping off people's hands. That doesn't usually lend itself to diplomacy. It's really, if you're going to do reunification work, leave the weapons, please. Yeah, exactly. Or just cut off a pinky. I mean, who really needs that finger anyway? You know what I'm saying? Or maybe like two of my toes. Mm. I'm not really too particular about two of my toes. So we were, we've were we talked about how these the story pulls on every myth of all time. But that idea that, you know, within everything there is a sacrifice. So Luke's hand becomes the sacrifice for the truth. He has to give something. He loses a hand. So Luke Skywalker, after episode six and before episode seven, tries to start his own Jedi Academy, Jedi Academy, and something went horribly wrong, and Ben Solo decides to kill all the other students. And I wonder if Luke's problems might have played a role in that. Maybe Luke's internalized transgenerational, intergenerational trauma played a role in the way that he was dealing with Ben that didn't go so well, but we don't know. That's a lot of speculation. And then as a result, Luke runs away to an island far away on a faraway planet and hides. Again, a extreme, an extreme reaction to a difficulty, one that uh, we could say is dysfunctional because it throws everything off balance and everyone starts searching for him. So that sense that I can only now solve these problems if I isolate. Right. No one can meet my needs. Exactly. And only I know how to take care of myself. Um, or I'm such a bad person, right. which I think Luke probably felt, I don't deserve to be with anybody. Mm-hmm. I'm a loser. Right. I, I tried to do something so big and it failed. I don't have a family around to help me pick it up. Or, or I'm too damaged inside to know that I can fail once, learn from that failure pick everything up and try again. And I deserve love from people around me, even though I've made mistakes. Mm -hmm. That's an important thing that when you are raised in a secure manner, you, for the most part, have that notion deep down when you're having your good moments, that I deserve love and attention and grace and the benefit of the doubt, even though I make terrible mistakes, you know? That that's that's not a notion that you are that you have when you are treated the way this family has been treated over the generations. So this concept of resilience, what makes one person resilient when somebody else is not when they've been through the same thing? Right. And that's that ability to, you know, if you don't have a caregiver is there. I often see this with the people I work with. There was a teacher, there was a coach, there was somebody who said, I'll still be here. For you and we can talk it out and if you know if you don't have that and you make a major mistake you tend to internalize all of the blame mm-hmm. right and you protect yourself from what you believe will be extreme rejection from other people by just rejecting them first pre- preemptively i'll show you yeah i made a big mistake you're probably going to hate me from now on i'll hate you first or I won't even open up to you to begin with because I'm surely going to make a mistake and you're surely going to reject me. So, And as therapists, our job, in my conceptualization, is to provide corrective experiences around that by having clients make mistakes, so to speak, not in the sense that you would have mistakes made if you were in someone's family, but, but reveal perhaps elements of the personality and of the self that are somewhat shameful to the client and to have the therapist provide a corrective experience by not rejecting that person. Sure. I I will still, I mean, this is what I said when I was training 
young clinicians, so much of this work is just showing up week after week after week, no matter what your client has done, if they have relapsed, if they've lost another job, if another partnership has fallen through, you continue to be there. And that object permanence also rewires the brain. It is the corrective experience that you don't disappear. Right. Which makes you more resilient to mm-hmm. other relationships outside of therapy. So let's get to Leia Organa. She's, she's given to Bale and Brea Organa on Alderaan, be- becomes a princess, more of this tr- intergenerational narcissism, perhaps. She experiences a ton of trauma herself from war. Mm-hmm. She's responsible for things. She's on the bad end of the stick regarding the Rebel Alliance. They're constantly getting beat down by the big empire. She marries Han Solo, and it's interesting the way they come together. Right. So, I mean, it's funny if you think of the the kind of good girl, bad boy dynamic. <laughs> the princess marries, you know, the pirate. It's kind of a perfect archetypal union Yeah. for her never getting to know her dad, who's the ultimate bad guy. So in a way, Han Solo is a safer bad guy. Yes. But do we know his backstory at all? Do we know anything about how he became... Han Solo? His primary... He also has a service animal. No, he is a Wookiee. <laughs> He's yeah. a, a sentient being. A service... I never thought that is hilarious. Han Solo has Chewbacca, the service animal. That's funny. Can he bring him on airplanes? <laughs> Does, Chewbacca the, doesn't have to wear a vest, but he does have that very styling. Is that what is a sash? Yeah, maybe in that universe, that's the service <laughs> animal service animal designation. <laughs> um, but oh, I but, wish I had a Wookiee. Go but yes, yeah, so, so so Leia is. I never thought about this, but I wonder if ba- Bale and Brea Organa gave messages to Leia growing up that she was the daughter of Darth Vader because they knew that Mm -hmm. they knew they knew who her father was. Well, family secrets, we could could probably do an entire episode. This idea that uh, people think that they are hiding things from their children and the children usually sense on some level that something is going on. Right. I mean, for both Luke and Leia, I never thought about this, but the people who raised them knew Mm -hmm. that the, the devil of the incarnate in the galaxy was their father, you are going, that's going to affect the way you approach that person. Things like in their mind, at the very least, they're thinking, Oh, is that, is that Darth Vader coming out in them? Is that Darth Vader coming out? And so subtly that socializes a child to have what I would call a complex regarding the dark and the light. Right. So is, I see this all the time in my work with clients who have a chronically mentally ill parent, there is continually the question of, was that behavior the sign that the mental illness is coming through me? Right. Um, But if you you don't know that, um, I'm I'm sure they must sense it at some level. Right. It's sort of like, don't think about an elephant. Mm -hmm. The more you think about something you're trying not to think about, the more you gravitate toward it. So then... Leia and Han have Ben Solo. They give birth to Ben. And Ben witnesses parental conflict after the wars or, you know, maybe even post-episode six wars or something. There's conflict between Leia and Han that Ben Solo witnesses. And and how is, you know, Leia able to parent? We don't know. Right. Han and Leia are both people who like to be free and like to, they like their jobs. They're mm-hmm. smuggling and generaling jobs. And it's hard to imagine either one of them being domestic mm-hmm. with a child. And we have evidence in episode seven that both of them didn't do so well. And then they gave Ben to Luke to be raised in the Jedi Jedi Academy, continuing this intergenerational trauma of being ripped away from your, from your Mm -hmm. parents. Anakin is ripped away from his mother and never even, never even having a father. Luke is 
ripped away, Luke and Leia are ripped away from their parents because the mother dies at birth and father is Darth Vader. And then Ben Solo ripped away from his parents right. and given to Luke. So I, when I worked in the South Bronx, it was amazing how many people were on both sides of the foster care system. Right. Had been born, placed in the foster care system. Then when they themselves have children, those children are placed in the foster care system. So these intergenerational issues, it's happening all around us. And getting back to American slavery, children during the slave years were often ripped away from their parents. Mm -hmm and sold to other families. And this has an intergenerational effect. So if you're ripped away from your parents as a slave, you have difficulty when you have your own children, even connecting with your own children, because you were never connected to as a child to your parents. And so as you raise your children, as say you were, say again, that fictional person or that hypothetical person being, in, as uh, a slave, as a child, and then freed after the Civil War, and you are raising your children, you've never been raised by parents. And so it, there's a different uh, approach to parenting frequently because of that. And you just extrapolate that through the generations. And today, you have, in the African-American community, you have many more families where the child is not being raised by the parents, it's being raised by the grandparents or aunts and uncles and, or this sort of thing. Because, not because these people are bad parents, they have been just through the generation, through the generations traumatized by uh, outside forces originally and then shall we say, intergenerational outside forces moving forward. Plus you add to the fact that black people uh, have been uh, marginalized and oppressed and, and murdered by, by white supremacists over the years, adding to the stress of being a parent. I'm not saying this is all African-American families, but if you are African-American yourself or you are close to African-Americans as I am, undoubtedly you can come up with stories of and statistically it's also true that they're much more likely not to be raised by their biological parents well plus one in four black men is incarcerated exactly so, <laughs> so you get a, another, that socio issue of constantly pulling right. the family apart right so and, and the temptation for people that don't get it today is to say well black people obviously there's something wrong with them compared to white people but no the psychology has demonstrated over and over again, there's nothing different about black people. It's just that when you have societal uh, factors that contribute, plus again, this intergenerational trauma and parenting attachment disruptions, it will result in a higher rate of these sorts of things happening. This isn't to say that white families and Asian families and Hispanic families don't have similar problems, because they do but just to at a, at a lesser rate. Uh, um, American Indian or Na Native American families have Same, a similar, similar similar problem. Of And in those families, it was the issue of being pulled into uh, white boarding schools right, where exactly. they were beaten and raped and all of these things. Right, the same basic premise, which is you have a system of tearing children away from their families and putting them in boarding schools to make them more white and more Christian and to make them less Native American. That was a, a governmental decision that was made and endorsed by the American people. And when you do that, you're going to have attachment disruptions. And when those attachment disrupted children grow up and have their own children, even if those children aren't ripped away from them, there's going to be an attachment problem with those with with raising those kids. So I have a great example of this. In my second year of internship, I worked. I ran a parent child dyad art group uh, at a treatment facility in Harlem, and it was supposed to be for the moms and the children to come together. But what we saw was that the moms had had so little time for themselves, and then their creativity, that they weren't able to make art with their child. Once given those supplies, they became consumed 
themselves and making artwork. Right. Um, because they had so rarely had time for quiet introspection because yeah. life was so pressured and with so many stresses. Right. Um, and so we literally weren't able to run the group the way we first imagined it because we hadn't thought through what these women would be bringing in. Right. And when, as a child, you're growing up and your parents aren't spending time with you for whatever reason, whether it be societal forces, governmental forces, or just their own issues regarding the fact that those parents weren't raised very uh, securely. The, when, when you're raised in an environment where you're basically just left on your own to fend for yourself, emotionally speaking, when it comes time to take care of your own children, you tend to think very independently you tend to think, well, aren't we all just basically alone on this planet? Why do I need to take care of this child? Can't they figure things out on their own? I figured things out on my mm -hmm. own. And sometimes there's that resentment of like, how dare this kid ask for so much love and attention? I was given almost nothing, and I'm giving this kid way more than I had as a kid. Why are they? They're so selfish. They keep asking for more and more. And so. And those of us who are parents know that the. A child's need for attention is constant. Right. Whether it's acting out or you think they're settled in an activity and then all of a sudden it's, mommy, you know, just when you've gotten, you know, deep in reading your own book, it's disrupted over and over and over again. So even I, as a, I don't know, fairly well-adjusted person, yeah, it's overwhelming. Right. And I just want to, say this caveat or this disclaimer about everything I just said that I hadn't really thought any of this through. We were going to talk about Star Wars. I had no idea I was going to be talking about race and intergenerational attachment security issues and say that I'm, there's a likelihood I said something that might be offensive. I don't know. I mean, I'm not an African-American, nor am I Native American. Uh, so, you know, feel free to uh, blast me about anything I just said. It's just my my educated opinion about why we see higher rates of certain things in certain. But also, if this groups. is new information for anybody listening, really go out and learn your American history. Yeah. Based on uh, what was done to both of these communities. Don't listen to me. In fact, you can read a book called A Different Mirror by Ronald Takaki, which I'm looking at right now. You can also read the book by Zinn called the people's history of America or something, United States. Um, but again, just to summarize, when you systematically, from a societal or governmental level, abuse a certain group of people, there will be ripple effects through the generations that require a lot of healing to get rid of that trauma. And it is present today and that's real and that isn't to say that all black people are like this or all native americans are like this but you, you just see higher rates of certain things and i would say you see it in the star wars movies yeah. so isn't it interesting that darth vader's grandchild is so freaking angry right Exactly. Like, where did that anger come from? Yeah. That is, if you've done any work with grandchildren of alcoholics, you see that. Like, even one generation away, with a kind of okay functioning generation in the middle, that sense of, you know, to be okay, I need an extreme amount of power, or I need an extreme amount of control, it can show up again. Yeah, it's well put. So... Ben Solo becomes Kylo Ren after being abandoned by his parents. Or perceived abandonment. Perceived abandonment, yeah, perceived abandonment. And he tries to internalize something strong, something, something of a fantasy, someone who has it all together, who doesn't need anybody, Darth Vader. Darth Vader, in his mind, needed nobody and had all the power in the world. And Kylo Ren turns to the same coping mechanism that Anakin did, which is, if I can become dominant and powerful and so above everyone else that I don't need anyone, then I can cope with the powerful emotional turmoil that I'm going through as a result of 
witnessing my parents fighting, witnessing my parents breaking up, being uh, sent away. Uh, it's it's uh, it's a tempting internalization to look for. Well, and all creative arts therapists can tell you this: that anger is endless. And once someone chooses anger as their primary motivating force, uh, they become, they lose touch with their humanity because they are missing going below the anger, which is to grief. The last few things I'll say about Kylo Ren is that he continues to search for Luke. Mm -hmm. He is searching for Luke. My hypothesis is that he's actually searching for his parents and maybe even particularly Han, Han Solo is his father, because he misses his father. He misses his parents naturally. But, and but Luke, spoiler alert, what does he do when he have access to his father? Right. He kills him. <laughs> and But he struggles with it. He, right. he wants to connect with him. You see that tenderness. This family has a really, I mean, look at this intergenerational pattern. Right. Is when you finally get the father-son connection somebody has to lose a hand or potentially their life it's really quite disturbing that's right because kylo ren is has a has a complex regarding his attachment to his father he on one hand is regressing to an earlier stage of dependency naturally to become dependent on his father but then there's another part of him that hates that part of himself because of the betrayal that it led to and the pain it led to and so he strikes out as a way of trying to cope with that by destroying his father. And it's a fantasy that if I, if I destroy my father, I won't need him anymore, but actually it just makes it worse. Well, and also that that weak part of myself will be gone. Right. So this is inherently how sexism works in our culture. Right. If that part of me that I perceive as weak, if I destroy it, then I will be even stronger. Right which is why Jung wants you to integrate your shadow self. That's right. Integrate the sacred feminine and the sacred masculine. That's right. I like it. So also, he didn't kill Ray at the first time he, the first number of times that he met Ray, even though he Ray, detected- Ray, also an orphan. <laughs> right. That he, he detected her, her force uh, abilities, but didn't kill her. Isn't that interesting? You'd think he would kill her right away. He'd be like, well, let's get rid of her. She's, she's one of the good guys. Why doesn't he kill her? Well, deep down, he needs companionship. He needs friendship and dysfunctionally searches for it from unavailable people in the same way that Anakin sought it from Padme. It all comes back around. Well, and it also uh, speaks to the narcissistic personality disorder, which is I have so few people that can meet me. Right. And when you do meet, I mean, I don't know if you've ever treated anybody who's a narcissist in your practice, but there's that funny thing when they realize that you, you can't, you are kind of an intellectual peer. It's kind of overwhelming. They kind of want to connect with you. They kind of want to keep coming back, but they're also repelled by you, but also kind of fascinated because you can keep up. Right. Well, I, you might be overestimating my intellectual abilities, <laughs> Rebecca, but, <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's the thing that happens if, if you are damaged narcissistically or stuck in a developmental stage of narcissism, you are uh, perhaps at least consciously believing that only people that are super, super awesome are worth your time. And that will play itself out in the therapeutic relationship. Well, what's our final thing that we can oh. say about, about the intergenerational traumas of the Skywalker family? I want to say, may the force be with you, Kirk. And be, and be with you. <laughs> I want to say, podcast on Star Wars, we will. <laughs> that took me a second. All right, well, that does it for another episode of Psychology in Seattle. Thanks for joining us out there. Please take care of yourself, and may the force be with you, because you deserve it. <laughs>